Welcome everyone. Oops. <laughs> so today we will be uh, talking about polar steam. So get to know polar steam, collaborating with educators and artists in your polar research. We are US APEX, the um, US Association of Polar Early Career Scientists. I'm going to start here with the webinar code of conduct before introducing our speaker. Um, so I'd like to uh, start by saying that US APEX wants to create and foster a welcoming, safe, productive, and inclusive environment. All participants are asked to remain respectful of others' thoughts and opinions and keep an open mind throughout the meeting. If at any time you have any concerns, we encourage you to reach out to one of the meeting coordinators. Please type all questions or comments you have into the chat feature. Moderators will communicate them to the speaker after the presenters are finished speaking. We ask that you remain muted at all times to reduce background noise. So what is US APEX? As I mentioned, we're um, the US Association of Polar Early Career Sci Scientists. We're the national committee um, representing US members um, within the larger APEX community. APEX is an international and interdisciplinary organization for undergraduate, graduate students, postdocs, early career faculty members, educators, and others with interests in polar regions and the wider, wider cryosphere. Our aims are to stimulate interdisciplinary and international research collaborations and develop effective future leaders in polar research, education, and outreach. We also work to ensure that all of our actions and collaborations are inherently focused on and informed by inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility or IDEA principles. So this includes advocating on behalf of our members in regard to pressing issues in polar research at the national and international level. Uh, we just wanted to do a little mini advertisement here for our upcoming Polar Film Festival. So in September 2024, we're going to have, I believe it's our eighth, yes, our eighth annual Polar Film Festival. Uh, last year, we had a fantastic um, roundtable with the filmmakers in September. And so we'll we'll have another webinar at that point with our filmmakers. Um, submissions can be uh, short films, medium films, long films. So if you're going out into the field this summer, or if you have some interesting work that you're doing uh, this summer or have done and have filmed in the past, then um, the deadline for submission of films is 15th of August. So um, you can see the submission information here, but you can also go to our website um, for more information. Okay, and last but not least, I'd like to introduce our speaker before handing it over to Michelle. So um, Polar Steam is uh, the science essentially stands for science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So STEAM might be a new term for some of you today. So it's essentially adding arts in alongside science, technology, engineering, math. It's an NSF funded program that creates teams of polar researchers, educators, and artists to engage in virtual and field research in the Arctic and Antarctic. Come join us in this US APEX hosted webinar to learn how you can collaborate with Polar STEAM as well as best practices for working with K-12 students, educators, and artists in your research. So today our presenter is Michelle Pratt. Michelle is the program manager for Polar STEAM. Michelle worked as a K-12 teacher in Alaska for 10 years, is a National Geographic certified educator, and also worked at McMurdo Station for two austral summer seasons in support of research efforts in the South Polar region. And Michelle is located at Oregon State University. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to her at this point. So I'll stop sharing. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. And as I get my screen share um, going here, I just want to make a plug for the Polar Film Festival. So last year, I was on board the Joides Resolution, which is a scientific um, drilling vessel from August through October. And we were in the North Polar region off the coast of Greenland. And as the expedition was winding down and we were in transit back to our port, um, the evenings started to become a little more available for everyone. And so we hosted the uh, film festival night every night for, I think it was five or six nights in a row. And we just, took all the US Apex films, divided them out, and we had movie nights every night with um, with Polar with the Polar Film Festival. So it was a really, really fun application of using the, 
these resources. So thank you so much, US Apex, for putting that together. Um, it was really an awesome experience because many of the researchers on board are polar scientists. We were working in the polar regions, and so it was just really relevant for them to be able to see um, selections from around the world. Okay, on to the topic. Uh, on to the topic. There was no paid endorsement for me um, promoting the <laughs> USA Effects Polar Film Festival, but it's just a really, really awesome opportunity. So on to the topic at hand. So today I'm going to be talking about broader impact success through educator collaborations, and I'll share some examples of what that can mean to you. So let me start just by giving a little bit of background information about Polar Steam and the team that runs that. So Polar Steam, as Kristen mentioned, is an NSF funded program, and it's run by an interdisciplinary team at Oregon State University. So you can see the four PIs here are listed on the screen and together they collectively bring expertise in broader impacts, educator scientist collaborations, art science integrations, and in polar research. The two full-time staff um, are myself and my colleague, Melissa Barker. Um, both of us have education backgrounds. Melissa, in addition to what um, Kristen shared about my background, Melissa also has some experience as well in experiential education and in educator science scientist um, Pro programs just like Polar Steam, um, and she had the opportunity to go up to the Arctic in about 10 years ago to participate in one of these programs, as well as a NOAA teacher at sea. So collectively, we bring a whole host of experience to, uh, to running Polar Steam. For those of you who've been around the National Science Foundation for a while, you might recognize some of the previous program names as Polar Trek and the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program. Both are programs that NSF has supported for a long time, and um, they're now collectively administered as Polar Steam. <clears throat> so here's the agenda of the topics I will be covering today. And I will say I'll pause at a couple intervals kind of after each topic to answer any questions that might be coming up. So if you have those, please pop them into the chat and then the moderators can kind of help me um, with addressing those questions as we go. I've also popped up the QR code and um, website and social media information because some people like to be able to follow along with that information during the presentation. So I have popped that up here on the screen right now and then I'll share it again at the end of the presentation. So if you don't catch it at this exact moment, just know it will be coming again at the end. So let me start by just giving a bit of, a, of an overview of how Polar Steam works and the programmatic goals that we have. So um, for researchers, Polar Steam is a partner in your broader impacts work. We work with NSF funded researchers in all disciplines. So that spans from social sciences to physical sciences, to mathematics, engineering, technology, essentially the STEAM uh, covering the broad spectrum of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And we really help as a broader impacts partner to amplify your work through science communication. Um, all, <clears throat> sorry, um, a unique aspect of Polar Steam is that we offer both virtual and field collaborations. This really opens up opportunities for researchers whose work isn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily lend itself to a field collaboration, but maybe you're doing some lab-based work, or maybe you're doing remote sensing work or data monitoring. Um, so really the adding the virtual component really opens up opportunities for those types of collaborations. And I'll give you some examples of those here as we go. Um, a, a primary question for researchers is what's the cost or, you know, will this cost my grant any money? And the answer is no. The National Science Foundation provides funding through our grant to help support the educators and artists that would be collaborating or could be collaborating with you. And so that helps 
reassure you that you don't need to cover those costs through your grant. National Science Foundation is supporting that through our grant. <clears throat> Since this is US Apex, I wanted to cover specifically um, some questions that early career researchers might have. And um, in terms of early career researchers, sometimes there can even be different definitions of what that means. So I just want to say that that is inclusive of all definitions of early career researchers and people that identify as an early career researcher. <clears throat> so as a Polar Steam Fellow, early career researchers or whoever is identified as the primary collaborator would be named the Polar Steam Fellow. So for example, someone who might be a graduate student or a postdoc working on a project with a lead PI, with that lead PI support, you could be the primary collaborator. And this would give you direct experience as the primary collaborator in a significant broader impacts effort, which can then lead to you being able to share that in any future NSF proposals as a support in your proposal to show your success in broader impacts. We have a couple uh, researchers who are in our current cohort who are postdoctoral recipients of the postdoctoral fellowship. And so they are the PI in their fellowship and they are, um, you know, operating as Polar Steam fellows as well. So this really opens up a lot of opportunities, particularly for early career researchers who are wanting to have a more active role in learning how to do broader impacts best practices for science communication, and really ready to take that leadership role, this really offers an opportunity to be able to do that with support, of course, of lead PI and then support through our cohort, which I'm going to go over in just a minute. <clears throat> um, also built into our cohort is some direct broader impact support. So if you're also at a point in your career that you're looking to learn how to use broader impacts tools and what broader impacts tools and ideas might be available to you. There's some support in our cohort as well to help develop that broader impacts identity and develop your broader impacts toolkit. So let me go with a couple examples here um, from early career researchers, a couple of quotes that um, that speak to how they are seeing benefits from working with Polar Steam. So Amy Lowitz is a researcher who works on the South Pole tel Telescope and the Event Horizon Telescope. She's collaborating virtually this year with Lori Orth, who's an educator, a music educator, um, teaches recorder predominantly and has written a previous recorder book about space and music. So the plan is to incorporate some of the telescope work into a music curriculum. So it's kind of a really exciting collaboration and a way of integrating polar sciences into music curriculum, maybe a place that students wouldn't normally encounter uh, polar sciences. <clears throat> And you can see here the benefits um, that Amy describes and um, the advice that she's kind of sharing with um, other early career researchers who might be looking to collaborate with educators. <clears throat> One second. Of course, you get a frog in your throat as soon as you're doing a presentation. It's always the luck of the timing. Uh, Julia York is a post is a postdoctoral fellow right now, and she works on the North Slope of Alaska in Ukiagbek studying fish. Um, Jeanette Perlow will be joining her this summer in a field-based collaboration as they go up to the North Slope, conduct research on fish, and then they're going to be working together to develop some curriculum related to that. And um, I really liked Julia's insights into what she feels makes a good, successful science educator partnership, especially from a perspective early in her career. <clears throat> the next topic I really wanted to cover, actually, let me pause for just a second.
let's pause and see. Are there questions about what I've shared so far, Kristen? Oh, yes, we actually have a question that just popped up from Marie. Um, I'm currently a postdoc not funded by NSF, but I'm very interested in polar steam. Are there opportunities to collaborate with artists or educators if I'm not working on an NSF funded project? That is a really great question, Marie. Thank you so much for asking. And it's a pretty frequently asked question. Um, we do need at least a portion of your research to be funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, our program is uh, funded by NSF designed to help support other NSF funded researchers. So that is one of the one of the few restrictions that we do in fact have. So um, if there is some connection with NSF funded research, please feel free to reach out and we could we could discuss further. So okay. I did want to talk a little bit about broadening participation and Polar Steam's goals around this. So Polar Steam's an inclusive program, and we view our program and our differences with curiosity and invest in diversity. We really aim to forge connections with communities that might have been historically underrepresented in polar sciences. We really want to expand the roster of participating people and elevate new voices that maybe have not had a voice previously. And we use an integrated approach to science communication to reach broader audience of learners. Um, when I was at AGU this last December, I attended a Paseco event and actually reflecting on this presentation and this, this specific slide, I think an example from that mixer event would be good. So this was a Paseco event designed to help everyone get to know each other. And one of the early career researchers that I met there asked a very straight question and said, well, um, why are you here at Paseco? Why do you want to talk to early career researchers? And my answer very much was related to this slide. Early career researchers are the change makers. You are absolutely the future of polar sciences. And this is where new voices are able to be elevated and recognized within polar sciences. So early career researchers are where the action and the change happens. So this is why we, one of the reasons that we actively want to seek out working with early career researchers, because you're awesome. <clears throat> so let me get, go on and share a couple more examples of research that's currently happening as well as share you share with you where we're working this year. Um, we're working in numerous locations throughout the Arctic, several locations in Alaska, which is a state that I lived in for a long, long time, almost 25 years. And um, uh, part of my experience in working in Alaska, in addition to teaching, I also worked for an agency that did a lot of work throughout rural Alaska. So I'm really finding it enjoying, and I'm really finding it rewarding and enjoying to work in work throughout rural Alaska again and applying some of that experience. We also have a team going to Greenland and a team that will be in way far Northern Norway. Um, you may or may not recognize some of these faces, people who are part of our current 2024-25 cohort. This is the group of people who will be working in the Arctic this summer. Um, we did have one team that has been out already, and I'll show a few pictures from their expedition. Uh, the team is Ignatius Rigger and Keegan Heron. Ignatius is a researcher who studies sea ice and how it interacts with the atmosphere and ocean. His primary tools for research are observation from drifting buoys and satellites, and his work helps to support the International Arctic Buoy Program. Keegan Heron is a high school science educator from North Carolina. He teaches in an English language learner program, and almost all of his students are new to the country, primarily from Central and South America. So one really exciting way that Keegan helps to connect his students with the research is by participating in the Float Your Boat project. 
Each of his students painted a wooden, bro wooden boat, which Keegan then brought up to Keagvik, Alaska in April. The boats were set out on the sea ice, and then as the ice melts, they set, are set adrift on the ocean. Each boat has a serial number, and if anyone finds one, they can enter that serial number into a database on the internet, and this helps the um, helps with the International Arctic Buoy Program to track ice, ice drifting and currents. Um, but it was a really powerful way that Keegan teaching English language learner students was able to integrate an arts focused project, which requires very little language. It's very um, hands on and very arts focused and really able to help them connect with Arctic research that's happening. And he shared with us that when after they got done um, painting their boats and creating their designs, Students asked, well, how are they going to get to the Arctic? How? And he said, that's what I'm doing. I'm literally going there. And um, they had not quite made that connection. And I found that in my own classroom as well, that students kind of can't quite get it till they get it. And then they and the, one of the ways that students can get that is by having their teacher be the one participating in this experience. And then that helps light that fire in students who remember that, oh my gosh, when I was in whatever grade level, my teacher had this polar experience and that got me interested in, you know, whatever they end up pursuing during their career. So it was a really, really powerful experience. During that time, they also connected with a local, with the local middle school, Hobson Middle School. And you can see a couple of pictures on the right are of one of their days out on the sea ice. So they brought um, an entire middle school class out onto the, onto the sea ice, practiced some traditional harpooning techniques, as well as measured, they're measuring albedo in that top right photo. And so students were able to connect with some polar science as well as with part of their indigenous heritage and culture. It was a very fast week, but a very rewarding week for that group. <clears throat> Let me share a little bit about virtual collaborations. I already mentioned that um, Amy Lowitz is working together with, uh, <clears throat> with Lori Orth. And so just to share a little bit more about their collaboration, their work is, their collaboration is all virtual. And um, Amy still deploys down to South Pole. Um, and we're all pretty aware right now that there's a lot of constraints in Antarctic deployments. And so this was a really great opportunity for Amy to be able to continue doing broader impacts work and working with an educator, even though there isn't currently a spot for that educator to be able to deploy. One of the really awesome benefits of Amy's work is that the Event Horizon Telescope is a network of telescopes. It's not an individual telescope. And so uh, Lori is actually going to be able to join um, uh, join Amy. Sorry, I'm getting my names twisted up. Lori will get to join Amy at one of the telescopes in Arizona this summer. So she will still get that hands-on experience of being able to see and be part of the telescope network system, even though she won't directly be going to the South Pole. So that's been a really powerful collaboration because she's able to still have a rich learning experience while we're while collectively working through some Antarctic challenges right now. So next, I wanted to share a little bit about getting involved and what that looks like for Polar Steam. So many researchers, one of the first questions people are usually curious about is what are the type of educators that we work with? What grades do they teach? Where, you know, where do we recruit from? And so we recruit educators from all of the STEAM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And um, we recruit community college educators, those working at MSI institutions, um, K through, I mean, sorry, grades six through 12 educators, so middle and high school, 
as well as informal educators. And I mentioned like Lori Orth, uh, her work is in music and um, music connections with science. And so she's really part of our informal group. Really broadly, anyone who's in an educational capacity and can demonstrate a connection to polar science and their classroom or their education work is eligible to apply. <clears throat> we do have teachers as well who are, um, sorry, it's not exactly teachers, but people working at science museums and um, similar type organizations who are also working as part of our cohort this year. So it really opens up a lot of opportunity for, in, for incorporating science into an informal education setting. <clears throat> we do recruit across, across the country. So in all uh, 50 states plus territories, and um, one of the requirements is that educators do need to be US citizens or permanent residents, but really that's the entire nation. So we recruit across the country, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we do that recruitment next. So I think that can be helpful just to understand what that looks like. So our annual recruitment cycle, we're working now to identify the researchers who would be interested in collaborations for 2025, 26 work. So a year to 18 months from now, depending on your research seasons. We work to identify um, the researcher groups first so that we have an idea of which types of research and locations, et cetera, that people are working in so that as we work to we recruit our educators, that we have a good idea of who we're matching with. Though the applications are open through August, um, we all know that the summer field season or just the summer enjoyment season can get really, really busy. So we do encourage researchers to try to get that application in before the summer so that it's just done and taken care of. And we know that we'll be working together. We're launching our educator recruitment right now. And with that application will be open for a couple months. And then we work internally on a selection process. So this is where one of the big benefits of Polar Steam comes in for researchers is we help offer that facilitated matching process. And um, this, uh, this allows us to use our expertise in education to really elevate educators whose work is going to um, have a meaningful impact on their classroom and within their community. And um, and really, we get to help vet them so that the the candidates that we're working with through the matching meetings are vetted candidates that we think would be good matches, um, both personality wise, interest wise, like professional interest, timelines, um, all of these things that can really trip up a recruitment process. We work through a lot of that internally. Then in the fall, we have some educator researcher matching meetings. And during those meetings, um, we facilitate them. Either myself or Melissa would facilitate those. And it's really an opportunity for educators and researchers to get to know each other and ask and answer some questions following those meetings. We um, get feedback from both educators and researchers on how the meeting went and if they see a likely match to be able to move forward. And then um, we do all the puzzle pieces and uh, December, January is when we ultimately make all of our selections and notifications. And then the cohort would start um, the next um, February. <clears throat> I wanted to share um, another early career researchers thoughts and feedback on the benefits to them of the Polish team's facilitated matching process. And I'm gonna take another drink of water and let you guys read that. So Merlin's been a really great collaborator and um, Yes, when we first met with him, this was kind of what he described to us, that 
I've been out there trying to make this match happen. And he very much had great goals of wanting to have an awesome educator researcher match and collaboration. And it just wasn't happening for him. And so we were able to work with him to identify his needs and um, offer several potential excellent matches, as you see he identified here. And then ultimately him and Christine are have been matched. And so they're working together now. And Christine works with um, as an informal educator, but she works to teach other physics educators in a community college and MSI setting. And so she's really kind of at that next level up of broadly influencing many, many um, other physics educators. So that's pretty, pretty exciting collaboration. Okay, I just have a couple other quick slides and then we can work through some questions. I'm happy to hang out and answer questions. So as I mentioned, once the recruitment process has concluded, then the, um, the cohort year starts. And so if, uh, if you're matched with an educator, um, then, um, then we would start with the cohort launch meeting in February. And that's really an opportunity for us to start building some community within our cohort. It helps us develop some uh, ideas for shared learning. And then there's a few months of shared learning environment, learning time, where educators are learning from researchers, researchers are learning from educators, and both people are really able to share some of their professional experience and expertise to lend that to this collective co-created product. Then there's kind of an intensive period somewhere in the middle of that year. And um, it looks a little bit different for virtual collaborations and field collaborations. Um, as I've, I've given a couple examples of how a virtual collaboration works. And so generally what's happening with those teams is they identify a period of time, not the entire year, but like a shorter period of time where they're going to dominantly do most of their work. Maybe it's at a time that the remote sensing is most active or relevant, or like, for example, Lori going to visit the telescope and building around that. So virtual kind of works that way. For field collaborations, the intensive time is the field-based time. And so we also help to set up some field prep meetings and ensure that everyone is on the same sheet of music regarding the field experience. Um, and so that when you get to the field, if um, if you're a field-based researcher, you know that the field time is usually a pretty intense time. So we work hard to set up the expectations and shared understanding ahead of time so that the field time can be used maximally for both the educator and the researcher to get what they need out of the experience. Following that, there is a period of time where everyone is working together with their teams and also coming back together to do some STEAM integration pieces. And so this is where we're also giving and receiving some feedback within our cohort and really able to support each other. And then ultimately, we're able to showcase and share a lot of the your broader impact success through this program. And that's hosted on our website. We'll be developing some other mechanisms by which you can share and really amplify this work. And ultimately, the biggest piece of success from that for NSF-funded researchers is being able to demonstrate that success in your final report for your project, as well as be able to use that in support of future applications. So especially for early career researchers, this can be a really huge benefit to being able to demonstrate your success in broader impacts. So what are the next steps? Um, this uh, is often a frequently asked question of, okay, now I've got my questions answered and how do we how do we move forward? So there's two different ways that people move forward. If you are ready to apply, the application is on our website and you can go ahead and submit that when you're ready. Again, prefer sooner rather than later before summer kind of rolls over you. Um, another option is uh, quite a few researchers actually do end up wanting to just talk through their project a little bit more. 
And so we have a, you can set up a 20 minute consultation where you and I can have a conversation about your specific project needs, how a polar steam collaboration would work in that regard. And then I can help answer any questions that you might have before submitting that application. Um, so you can either email um, polarsteam at oregonstate.edu or actually on that QR code, there's also a link to book directly on my calendar with a calendaring tool. So that's an option as well. I also did want to mention some people are curious about pre-planning for future seasons beyond 25, 26. Some people are writing proposals or your funded research won't take place until, you know, beyond 25, 26. It is really good if we're aware of that. And so if you can just email, if that applies to you, feel free to just email me at that address. And then we can either set up a consultation to chat a little bit more about it, or I can add you to our list of collaborating researchers for future years, kind of depending on what applies the most. So this is my last saw slide. I said the contact info and the QR code would be coming back. So there it is. Um, if you're not already signed up for our um, email list, many people find that to be helpful as well, particularly if you're thinking, oh, this doesn't apply to me today, but it might apply to me in a year or two. And um, But I know for myself, it can be really easy to forget <laughs> about that opportunity. And so joining our email list would allow you to stay in contact. We don't send very many emails, but we do send relevant ones, particularly when we're opening recruitment or when we're hosting a webinar or something like that. So um, that's a really great way to stay in contact. Okay, Kristen, I see there's a number next to the chat. So <laughs> Yes, so we don't have any active questions now. So I, oh, we do have a question that just popped up. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read it. It's from Benjamin. Um, thank you for the presentation and information and programmatic implementation and outcome assessment geared towards broader impacts and societal benefits. How is the inclusion of meaningful engagement of Arctic Indigenous peoples and Arctic Indigenous students alongside indigenous, indigenous knowledge strategically leveraged to catalyze positive influences and advancements in the scientific inquiry in pursuit of secondary education of Arctic indigenous peoples and students. It's important to note that by Arctic indigenous peoples, it specifically refers to, refers to indigenous communities and not be conflated with local or rural communities. So yeah, really that Arctic indigenous mm -hmm. peoples and student integration um, idea. That's great. Ben Benjamin, it was Benjamin? Okay. Yes. Benjamin, thank you so much for that question and for being specific in clarifying which part you're meaning. So um, I think maybe the best way to answer is with an example. So I'll give an example of our team that's working in Northern Norway. And so the Northern Norway team is a large interdisciplinary team and um, that falls under the NNA, the Navigating the New Arctic Structure at NSF. They intentionally have an anthropologist and some social scientists as part of the elements of their team. And so that team's role is really very specifically to ensure that people living in that region are included, their voices are heard, that the project is, the project, the social science outcomes of that project are really driven by the community's request, as opposed to necessarily driven by the social science scientist's request. So for us, Polar STEAM, um, we really work with the researchers needs and it's but it's really more researchers needs to identify or the researchers role to identify community engagement and engagement with indigenous peoples um however we very much support that so i hope that distinction kind of makes i hope that distinction is helpful and please let me know if you need clarification we have another question from Kevin. How much of Polar Seam's work focuses on fieldwork projects? Have you worked with modeling projects or anything similar? Oh, 
Yes. So if I go, um, if we think back to the slides where I was showing our, um, actually, let me just go back to those slides. Oh. So we do, do work in both field and virtual environments. So this is the group of people that will be in the field this summer in the Arctic, just to give you a sense of how much of Polar Steam's work focuses on field projects. The column on the left, uh, the Antarctic Field Group, they will also be in the field. But the other group that you see here on the screen, this is our virtual group. And so, for example, for modeling, let me look at this group. Um, so Elizabeth Webb, her work is really focused on lakes in Alaska and specifically permafrost, how permafrost melting and, um, you know, is affecting lakes within Alaska. She uses high res photography and works through a lot of modeling to help understand and uh, to help understand some of the lake dynamics and some of the related climate science. And I'm probably not doing her, the description of her project enough justice, but I'm sure she could articulate it a lot better, but her project is very modeling focused. The other project to draw attention to is Filippo and Steven. So Steven is a PI on a project that, uh, oh gosh, it's it's really fancy acronym is PENGUIN, but it's Polar something guided inquiry. <laughs> I'm getting it wrong. Um, and But essentially what they do is um, Stephen's project, his NSF funded work is to help bring polar data into an undergraduate classroom. So into like a community college classroom. And so Stephen works exclusively with polar data sets, not field work. And Filippo is a math educator at a community college. And so they will be developing a lesson that helps to integrate polar data sets, polar data into Filippo's math classroom. And so that helps to support Stephen's work by um, continuing to enhance and promote um, polar sciences in, oh, sorry, polar sciences in the community college environment and also helps Filippo with being able to provide really great real world examples for his students in, in his classroom. So hopefully that gives a couple examples for modeling. Oh, one that's not on the screen, but um, is directly related to Kristen's other work. Um, is a Coldex researcher that we worked with last year. And so this particular researcher works on ice melt probes and um, lots of modeling there, lots of practical application and engineering. Their collaboration was virtual again. And um, the educator on their end, they um, collaboratively designed some education specific specs. So, uh, you know, a way for students to be able to build a similar or a test model of this ice probe. And then in this educator's classroom, they froze ice in five gallon Home Depot buckets and um, had a race or a competition to see whose probe that they had to build, whose uh, drill that they had to build could make it to the bottom of the five gallon bucket the fastest. So um, hopefully that answers and gives a few examples of some more data or modeling style collaborations. Thank you, Michelle. That sounds so fun. Um, so we have another uh, question that was sent to me uh, as a direct message. So I'll read it, read it from Valentine. All the examples of collaborations discussed were between researchers and educators. Can you give any examples of working with artists? Mm, that's great. Thank you so much, Valentine. Um, uh, so some examples. We have one artist and writer who's been selected for this particular year and she will be on board the Nathaniel B. Palmer in, um, uh, I think she goes in December, January, I think are her dates. She works with some data visualization modeling and will be using a lot of the data sets collected on the ship to develop some artistic renderings of data. And so it's a really fun way to be able to integrate art and science. In terms of Polar Steam, that is the first artist and writer that we have selected, but there is a really long legacy of the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program 
And a lot of their work can be seen at the Antarctic Artists and Writers Collective website. I'll try and pop that um, pop that website into the chat here if I get half a second, because there are numerous previous artists and writers who've done amazing work. And actually, what this penguin photo was taken by one of the previous artists and writers, Anthony Powell, who produced a really excellent film as part of his artist and writer work. Thanks for that question, Valentine. Right. Any other questions? I guess I have a logistical question, Michelle. So if you are a graduate student, you spoke about the fact that your PI um, or advisor would sort of have to sign off on your participation potentially. Um, what does that look like? And does that also mm. include students who have the graduate research fellowship program? Mm. So let's see the, so for the graduate research fellowship program, um, those people are their own lead PIs in my experience. And so as the PI on that project, that's like you're the approving authority because you are the PI on that project. For um, people who are working more in a graduate student or a postdoc uh, role, but as part of a research, as part of the research team where there's a different PI that's in charge. So what that typically looks like is you would express your interest, we would have a chat, and then we would also need to have a conversation with the lead PI. Typically, that's a quick 30 minute Zoom where we just discuss the, you know, your desire as the early career researcher to have this Polish team collaboration. I help answer any questions that the lead PI might have. And then there's just a short agreement document that the lead PI and the collaborating researcher would sign just so that we're all on the same sheet of music about the collaboration and whose role whose role is what. Um, but yes, because, um, I mean, I think that would make sense to most people in this audience that because the lead PI, it's their project, they absolutely need to have an awareness of the broader impacts work that's occurring within their project. Wonderful. Any other audience questions? I have one more, but I'm going to give a moment to see if we have any audience questions. So if you're a student or postdoc or, or, or a more senior um, researcher and you're wanting to write polar steam into your broader impacts proposal or the broader impact section of your proposal, how, when do you recommend that you reach out, that they reach out to you to discuss those options? How far ahead of time uh, before the proposals do? Um, and yeah, what does that look like? Yep, that's a great question. Thank you. I should have covered that. I'll add that to my presentation in the future. I think you covered some of it. I just wanted to broaden a little bit deeper. Thank you. Um, so at the point that you're considering including Polish Steam in your proposal is the best time to reach out and have a chat. Um, uh, sometimes I've heard from some people that broader impacts might be the last section that people write in their proposals. And so earlier is a little bit better because then we're able to provide some substantive um, content that you can include in your in your research in your research proposal. I should say as well that it is not it is not required that you have us written into your research proposal to be able to work with Polar Steam. So we do work with a lot of researchers who had expressed interest in their broader impact statement of possibly working with an educator collaboration, but they hadn't really identified Polar Steam as the mechanism for doing that. And so even if we're not intentionally written in, then there is still an opportunity for us to be able to work with people even post award. Um, and there is some specific language that needs to be included, um, like a one or two sentence in, if we're being included in a pre-proposal, Polish team operates as a cooperative agreement. And so we're unable to provide letters of support, which might be traditionally something that people are a little bit more familiar with, but we have some language to help with your grant writing proposal, um, for that. Wonderful. That's really good to know. Thanks so much, Michelle. No problem. Okay, any last minute questions? But of course the contact information is in the chat. Um, Michelle, feel free to add your personal email or they can just email Polar Steam. I put that in the chat as well. 
Um, so any last minute questions from our audience? All right, well, you know where to find Polar Steam. And I'm gonna go ahead and end here with just um, our last slide for the webinar. And so we just really wanted to thank you all for coming. This is really fun. I learned a ton. Thank you so much, Michelle, for telling us all about your program and your amazing researcher, educator, artist teams. If you would like more information about US Apex or any of our events, you can see our website here. You can go to our Gmail. You can follow us on Blue Sky, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. And this um, webinar will be posted on YouTube within the next week. So check out our YouTube if you'd like to see a recording. So thank you all so much and um, have a wonderful day.